Everyone on the live stream, thanks for being here or catching the video recording afterwards. Hey, Mike. Hello. About ready to do this podcast thing? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> All right, well, let's kick it off. Mike, welcome to Talk Python to Me. Yeah, thanks so much for having me again. Yeah, it's great to have you here. You know, uh, maybe we just remind people of the last time you are here. You wrote a really cool book called, I think it was Python Interviews. Is that the, do I have the title correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, and that was back in episode 156, way back in 2018, like three years ago, I guess, more mm -hmm. than that. But it was a history book, so it's looking back, right? It's it's fine. It's still relevant. People can check that out. And I really love some of the stories um, that you told on there. I, I love, I think it was Alex Martelli. You interviewed him mm -hmm. and talked about how Google Video and YouTube we're sort of competing neck and neck, and that was sort of a Python versus C++ story. That's probably the one that stuck with me the most. Yeah, I really enjoyed that one. Although there's some good stuff in the Brett Cannon interview as well. Yeah, there's great stuff all over. I'm just trying to think of the one that I can remember <laughs> years later, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, well, it's been a couple years since you've been on the show. What have you been up to? Well, since that book came out, I have been pretty prolific in my writing and continue to write more Python books. Um, for example, I've written one on WX Python and uh, Report Lab. Mm -hmm. I redid Python 101, which was my first book, and I completely Report re Lab is yeah. Report sorry, Report Lab is about like working with PDFs, right? Yes, you can use it to create PDFs, it, but that book also covers um, how to edit. Well, I shouldn't say edit. How to read and get data out of an existing PDF as well. Yeah, cool. You got a couple of uh, 101, 201 type of books as well for yes. like learning Python. Yep. Python 101 is for beginners and 201 is kind of intermediate advanced. So if I was like a sophomore, I might take that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. So what are you doing these days? Are you doing the independent thing with your authoring and creating? Are you doing consulting? What are you up to? Oh, I still would do a full-time job. Um, I, I write Python code that tests an embedded C++ application with Python. Oh, it's, nice. It's really neat. But I also, you know, kind of as a hobby slash side job, I, I write for for myself. I write I write these books, and I occasionally contribute to Real Python as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of good stuff going over at Real Python. Dan and crew keeps that uh, the content flowing over there for sure. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to talk about building GUIs or GUIs, as some people say them. I don't know. I'm a GUI. Are you a GUI or are you a GUI sort of person? I usually call it GUI. Yeah, me too. Um, so we're going to talk about those for Python, which I think is interesting because there are and there have been and there are decent options, but it's not a place where Python has traditionally received a ton of a focus and energy mm -hmm. uh, on building. A lot of these frameworks have to do with taking another framework that's a nice cross-platform framework and like py making it friendly for Python, right? I'm thinking of like yeah, PyCute or even WX Python, right? Yeah, it's usually a C++ wrapper that pre-existed Python and then it got wrapped with bindings of some sort. Yeah, exactly. A lot of these, especially the ones that do native widgets, those... Mm -hmm are really just wrappers over the operating system when doing APIs, right? Like Win32 or uh, what is it? Coco on Mac OS, yeah. uh, those kinds of things, right? So it's like some thin layer than some adaption, adapting thing for Python, right? Yeah, I think there's only a, a handful that aren't wrapping something else like um, Beware's Toga, I don't believe is wrapping um, the native, I was trying to look, it is, I guess it is wrapping in a way, but it's not wrapping a pre existing uh, framework. Right. Right. It's probably super low level. Like here is a literally create a window that is a button. <laughs> and that's yes. it. Like not, um, not like cute or something. Or, you know, QT yeah. I, I think Togo is actually like, you know, trying to render the Cocoa widgets or the Win32 widgets itself, you know, rather than yes. calling like cute or WX. 
Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's some value to that. There's some value to that. Mm -hmm. So I thought the place that we could start is maybe a survey of these different libraries that we could use. Sure. Right. And so let's start with Tinker, TK enter, um, uh, which is really the Python interface to TCL, TK, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this one comes built in, right? I'm here on the Python 396 documentation and I guess this is the official way to create GUIs with Python, right? I mean, in the sense yeah. that it ships with it. It ships with it. However, on like Linux, it, the, like the system Python does not come with it. Okay. And so I believe so I believe Mac is the same way. You have to install it separately for its system Python too. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. Well, you know, the, the system Python and Mac is all sorts of outdated and and yes. whatnot, basically, right? Like two seven, who knows what, right? But yeah, but it always surprises uh, me when I go to import tkinter and it's like, oh, it's not there. And like, what the? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you know, tell us tell us about this one. Like, what's the what's the the good side? When would you use it, or would you use it? When wouldn't you use it? Um, for me, I I don't like it because it it looks old fashioned, but mainly because it, it draws all its own widgets, just like some of the other um, GUI toolkits. So basically, yeah. when it, when you create a tkinter GUI, you know it's a tkinter GUI because it doesn't look native. However, right. um, you can use a tkinter. The code can be um, written without classes. You could write it completely functionally and still make it work. So, you know, as a learning way to create a GUI, it might be a good first, you know, a good beginner or first GUI to create with. Yeah, absolutely. Here, I put up on the screenshot, uh, the screen for us to see, there's like this TK Enter hotel management system. It definitely doesn't, if I didn't see the top bar, I couldn't tell you what OS that's from, but it, because it doesn't look mm -hmm. like any OS that I know, right? Although, uh, there's another example. I'll put these in the show notes. There's a pretty nice one that's hosting um, some kind of sort of it's it's like a predates Jupiter or something like hosts mm -hmm. hosts map plot libs exploration and stuff. And you know, that one that looks like a pretty solid app to me. Yeah, Tkinter did add um, a sub module called TTK, which does look a lot more native across platforms. <laughs> So you, you can make it look nice, actually, if you if you spend the time. But you're going to have trouble finding good examples online because a lot of them just use the old the old interface. And yeah. one other one other thing I do want to note about Tkinter is it's themable. So if you want it to look, you know, you want to add themes to your your GUI. You know, Tkinter is an option for that. Oh, interesting. It was like so. For example, you could give it a Mac OS like theme that turns on in that platform and a Linux theme. Maybe yeah, in a dark I, mode and a, a not dark mode. Yeah, I was thinking of dark modes, light modes, be giving them a certain you know color things, kind of like a Winamp type skin. Yeah. Oh man, remember how crazy those skins would get? They'd get like three D <laughs> with little holes cut in them, and yeah, that stuff got that got yes. wild. Little, little drawers, like an alien tongue would shoot out, and that's where like the playlist mm -hmm. would. Don't do that, people. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Okay, so for the most part, Tkinter is built in ish. At least it's sort of somewhat officially part of Python, right? Yes, it is. Uh, another one, one that I think of a lot when I think of cross platform stuff is Qt, Qt, mm -hmm. and PyQt. There's been a lot of different versions of PyQt. They're like a lot of. Stuff with licensing. So, like right here on the homepage, it says licensing PyQt is dual license on all the platforms under mm -hmm. GPL3 and the Riverbank commercial one. Unlike Qt, PyQt is not available under LGPL, which is, I guess, what you would need for like a commercial closed source app. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, there's another wrapper around Qt <laughs> that I think is LGPL. Like the there's a lot of stuff that's just like, whoa, why is it so complicated? Yeah, PyQt is kind of confusing when it comes to its licensing structure. Yeah, which is crazy because I've had this conversation multiple times and it seems like it, I don't know, it either it never resolves clearly in my mind or um, it's just challenging. Uh, but that said, 
there's really nice apps built with Qt. So for example, like one of the database tools I use for working with MongoDB is Robo3T. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Robo3T, this thing is glorious in terms of its sort of native look and feel. Like if you go to the robomongo.org, scroll down mm -hmm. for the screenshots, there's the three OSs side by side and every one of them looks like it belongs on that platform, right? Yeah. Um, you can get a little bit simpler with, instead of using PyQt, you could use Qt for Python, which is the new name for PySide. That's right. That's right. And it has a, a more permissive licensing structure. That's the one I was thinking of. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. They renamed that to Qt per, for Python, right? I believe so. Although the yep. import is still PySide. <laughs> is it still PySide? How interesting. It's like PySide 6, I think. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how interesting. So this, I think... Qt's a, a pretty solid option. I feel like I, I see Qt being used in embedded systems and other types of things. Like I said, I, I started using RoboMongo just because it seemed like a good app and like, oh, this is a Qt app. It's not a Python is a C++ app, but it just as well could be. Like there's nothing mm -hmm. fancy about it that it makes it have to be C++. It just happens to bend that way. Yeah. Yeah, so what are your thoughts on uh, this as one of the, the options? Oh, Qt is really powerful. You can do a you can do a ton, and it and it while it draws all of its own widgets itself, it's not actually using the native widgets. Um, it looks native. So this again, made an effort, yeah. Yeah, again, you this one is also themable. If you want to do themes, you can change you know dark mode, light mode easily, because it's all drawn itself. Um, I think PyQt and PyQt for Python both support QML which is kind of an XML version of the C++ library. So you can kind of write it, write your GUIs in, markup, in a markup language. Um, they, the nice thing about- Yeah, that's Qt, right. It's a little bit like XML or um, yeah. XAML from the Microsoft space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. It also has a, uh, what you see is what you get editor. The, I think it's Qt Designer. Mm -hmm. That works for both C++ and Python. Um, I believe the Python side, you have to do some special imports to actually use the UI file it generates. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that seems like a really valuable thing to me to visually be able to say, I want this widget to be here, I want this one to stretch like that, and so on. Yeah, I work with a bunch of uh, C++ cute guys, and we they use the designer, but occasionally it will do crazy things when your design gets really complex where it's really hard to get stuff to stretch the way you want it to. Yeah. And sometimes you just have to drop into the code to make it work right. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that's probably the case with many of the frameworks, right? Not yeah. just the, these Python ones we're highlighting, but you know, Xcode, well, .NET, whatever, right? <laughs> I think this, that's just the problem with auto-generated UI code. Whenever you use a designer like that or Visual Studio, you're going to run into quirks. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Next up on our list here is Kivi. Kivi, mm -hmm. I heard about a lot from, uh, I think, sort of building mobile apps with Python mm -hmm. in interesting ways. It's kind of got this game, draw your own UI sort of feel to it. Yeah, it's it's also cross-platform. It runs on uh, mobile too, though. So you can, you can deploy its apps to Android and Apple OS. Um, but yeah, a lot of the stuff on there, well, I, I should back up. It, it was originally developed for multi-touch. So like Microsoft's original uh, Surface Table, I think is what it was originally developed for. Yeah. But, you know, obviously it also works great on multi-touch uh, phones and whatnot. But yeah, all of its wid widgets are drawn uh, by Kiwi itself. So they look like a Kiwi app most of the time. Yeah, they have a gallery over here. Mm -hmm. And in the gallery, they even have like some surface table exploration stuff, like the city of Marseille uh, map exploration type thing, right? Um, they have a Kiwi garden, I believe, that also showcases lots of custom widgets. Yeah. So when I look at the, I'm scrolling through the uh, gallery here, I feel like there's a lot of 2D sort of interactive Mm -hmm. things a lot, lot of games or stuff like that right so it's if i wanted to build an app that maybe 
looked like it used the Windows rich text box and the Windows button. So it looked like a, I don't know, a Windows 10 button on Windows 10 and a Windows 11 button with curved mm -hmm. edges. Like, it's not that kind of framework, right? No, it's not. And okay. I believe Kiwi is based on, uh, written on top of Pygame. So it has, that's why I can do games so well. Right. Yeah, I, it sounds familiar to me as well. And apparently the winner of the Python Discord Code Jam 6 was uh, done in Kiwi. So that's pretty hmm. cool. That is cool. As well as, as, well as second place. Hmm. So uh, I was see, unaware. Is, is there a third place one down here? <laughs> yeah, it is. They, 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 wow. There's a clean sweep of the podium with Kiwi. So that's pretty impressive, actually. Yeah. I've actually cool. played one of their games on my phone before, and they, they seem pretty well done. Nice. Uh, another one that's gotten a lot of traction and has its own opinions for how it works is Pi Simple GUI. Mm -hmm. I think Mike Barnett, is, if I'm remembering correctly, is working on that. Yeah. And yeah, it's um, the idea is to make it super simple to just get a basic UI up and running, right? Yeah. So Pi Simple GUI wraps, uh, I think, four or five other frameworks. So it wraps Tkinter, WX Python, PyQt, uh, Remy, which is a mobile thing, and something else, and basically gives you the same API for all of them. So that you know, if you write your code once, and then you just change the import from like py import PySimple GUI to import PySimple GUI Qt or PySimple GUI WX, you can get that native look and feel because you're using oh, WX yeah. or Qt. Oh, that's a really cool aspect, right? That you can swap out the, the widget engine or something, basically. Mm -hmm. Yep. The yeah, default really is key enter, but Yeah, probably because it's the least dependencies and you don't have mm -hmm. to think about which kind of license you're doing what with. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so this is a pretty cool one. If you're just trying to get a dialogue up that like has us one or two buttons and an input and a progress bar, maybe this is a good option. They can do quite a bit of uh, complex GUIs too. They, there's a demo package that they have that shows how to integrate it with Mat Matplotlib and OpenCV and lots of other things. But these examples okay. don't show the advanced stuff it can do. Right. I'm just sort of paging through the uh, gallery, the screenshot yeah. that they have on the, the site there, which we'll link to. And again, since it's using Tkinter, it also does themes natively. Or at yeah, least for the key cool. part. Yeah, Sorry. exactly. Yeah, yeah, super cool. Okay, that's another option out we got out there. Mm -hmm. uh, one that you put in the list that I haven't really done anything with is Dear Pi GUI, a fast and powerful graphical user interface toolkit for Python with minimal dependencies. Yeah, this Tell one looks. This one. <laughs> this one I haven't played with very much yet, but. Um, I believe the guy who created it has been working a lot on it lately, and uh, it has a really neat interface. I don't think it's wrapping anything, but I could be mistaken. It looks very focused on providing animated and interactive aspects for like scientific visualization and exploration. Yeah, I think it is. It, I don't believe it tries to look native necessarily either, but it has a very slick interface. Yeah, yeah, it does. There's a lot of cool stuff that's going on here. Okay, so that's a neat one. And I guess one that I didn't properly cover uh, yet because I didn't pull up in our little list here, but is a Toga from Beware. You mm -hmm. touched on that, right? Yeah. So uh, this, all the stuff over Beware is super neat. There's a lot of nice things going on. It, definitely the native widgets feels I, don't know, I just always feel kind of like ah oh, this thing doesn't really belong here right when i see an app that's, <laughs> it just looks like you're like this is you know some clearly cross-platform not really this platform uh feel right yes and i don't know I, I appreciate the the native widgets aspects but it's also listed in sort of the maturity level as early development right so i'm not sure if this is ready for you to pick up and build with yet yeah, not really is my understanding. Um, and oddly enough, it's been in early development for like the last five years. 
Yeah. So it's been really slow to develop, which, I mean, they're, they're trying to do it from the ground up and they're not wrapping anything. So it's somewhat understandable. But I, I think they recently added Android support. So I think that they're focusing more, more on the mobile stuff than, you know, like Windows and uh, Macs, native OSs. Yeah. The last uh, commit was a merged PR from Russell Keith McGee four days ago. So there's still still yeah. action. Yeah. Yeah, they're still happened. working on it. <laughs> Nice, nice. All right. Well, that brings us over to the WX Python, which is another one of these options in this mm -hmm. space, but that's what we're going to focus on in this particular episode, right? Sure. Yep. So give us the quick overview of WX Python sort of compared to these other options we've been covering. So WX Python is, again, a C++ project. Um, it wraps uh, WX widgets or Wix widgets, I've heard it called. Um, it works on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and Raspberry Pi. Uh, the big thing about uh, Debix Python is that it does do native widgets wherever possible on all platforms. Um, yeah, that's so cool. That's, that is really cool. Um, it also provides a lot of custom widgets in case you, you need them for certain purposes, like some... I believe I think, I think it was Mac that didn't have a toggle widget for a long time, so they provided a, their own toggle widget for it. Right, it's uh, the the GUI equivalent of a polyfill. If like <laughs> that feature is not supported, but you want it, well, like all right, here's that something that'll do for mm -hmm. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. So it looks, you know, it looks to me like it checks a lot of the right boxes. What's the licensing story? It's very permissive. Um, Let's see, I'll pull, up the, I'll pull up the repo and hit their license doc and see what I can find. I know it, they called it the WX Python license, but I'm trying to remember. Ah, uh, that's remember. right. It looks LGPL-ish. Yeah, I think it is mostly LGPL. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Okay, so that's better than multi-license confusing, like the C layer has one license and the Python layer has another license, but then there's mm -hmm. the commercial license. Um, so it seems like it's pretty easy for you to just to decide to adopt it and use it on your project. Yep. I would agree with that. And uh, so it's also extremely stable. They almost never uh, break uh, your code when they release a new version. Okay. That's cool. I heard that it rose from the ashes. <laughs> so they've got yeah. the, the 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 Phoenix release and then the I don't know, legacy or traditional version. What's the story of that? Oh, yeah. So you know, Python three came out, and a lot of people you know fussed about supporting it, and it was a it was a pretty big deal to to port Python uh, Debx Python to Python three because Debx Python has a really small group of core developers. But eventually, he created. Uh, Robin Dunn is the main guy behind WX Python currently, and he decided, well, we're going to call it Project Phoenix while I get this working. And I think he actually switched the way he binded to Wix widgets at the time because he went from like Swig to, I believe, SIP, which is a different type of binding. Okay. And that made it a lot easier to support both Python two seven and I think it was three four was the first uh, three release for. Debix Python. And that also made it pip installable. So that was super awesome when he got that working. So if I want to use it, I can just pip install Debix Python or that's Wix Python, uh, as I'm, I'm learning that I might want to say it that way. <laughs> yes, that's correct. Um, uh, there are There's a caveat on Linux that sometimes you need to have a couple of extra Linux dependencies installed. Um, but other than that, uh, pip install should work. Yeah, well, that's pretty standard, right? If you're doing GUI stuff on Linux, mm -hmm. a lot of times, like, there's elements there you got to add. So it doesn't seem outrageous. No. Yeah. So another thing that I'm a big fan of, to the extent that they work, and the better that it works, the more I'm a fan of it, is the, like, the GUI designer. So there's two over here, right? We've got, like, this WX or Wix form builder and the Wix Glade. Mm-hmm. I think I tried the Wix form builder and it just 
it kept crashing, not like it would start and was unstable. Like it would not start <laughs> for me. And I don't know what the deal, maybe it was the version of yeah. Mac OS I was running on or something. But what's the story? Are these are these things that people would use? Uh, like what's the, yeah, what's the story around the, the WYSIWYG side so, of these? Debbie's Python traditionally hasn't had really a, a WYSIWYG editor, but people have tried to build them. So I think Debian's Glade is probably the one that's been around the longest. Okay. And probably the best supported. Um, I don't think it, I think it supports the core widgets of Debian Python. If you were to pull up the Debian Python demo app, there are like 100, I, I would say at least 100 widgets, maybe more, maybe 200. So okay. the core widgets, you know, are like buttons. Is that, uh, do I find that under yeah. widgets? Um, oh, you would find thing. that under, let me see, downloads. Downloads, there you go. Unfortunately, it's actually something you run locally. Yeah, sure, sure. But yeah, so it's if you could download, I think I have run that before. And you basically, it, it's like got all these windows that'll show you little use cases for this widget or that widget, right? Yeah, it also shows you the code and you can edit the code live in the demo and see how it, how it changes. Oh, that's it. But... Anyway, that so yeah, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's okay. Well, I was talking about we we're talking about Glade and the, oh, yes, the, Glade. the GUI stuff. Yeah, yeah, I believe it do, it does a decent enough job. I think it outputs a, a Python file, so that's nice. Um, it doesn't put you know like Qt's designer out, outputs a UI file that you have to figure out how to import and then use. This one actually right. outputs a Python file. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's um, really good. So I'm looking at the screen here, and it looks like Audacity, the well-known audio uh, audio editing app, is hmm. built in DubX. I'm guessing. Otherwise, there's no reason yeah. they would feature it. I believe that's true. I'm not sure if it's Wix Widgets itself. Yeah, it's on the Wix Widgets site. Okay. So uh, and I'm pretty sure it's a C sort of thing. But yeah, these are these are pretty good looking apps that you can like sort of page through all their screenshots on just. Wixwidgets.org. So mm -hmm. almost even like an auto trader looking thing and like a diff tool. A file merge. Yeah. Audacity. Yeah, I believe one of the Linux diff tools is written with JBX Python. And I had heard that um, the Dropbox UI was written with WX for a while. I don't know if it still is or not. Yeah. Cool. So it seems like there's quite a rich um, library for working with these things with WebEx, Python, or Wix Python. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And I guess you may, maybe one of the nice ways to explore this would be, where am I going to go? I'm going to go over here a little bit, to talk about uh, sort of some of the things you covered in a recent book that you wrote. Not super recent, but somewhat recent. Creating mm -hmm. GUI applications with Wix Python, which uh, is pretty cool. And a uh, comment from the live stream out there, Jurgen says, "Congrats on the successful fundraiser for your latest book, which is not this book, but like uh, no. And what what book is that that you're just working on now? Um, I'm working on one that talks about um, automating Excel with Python using OpenPy Excel. That's right. Yeah. Well, that's a, certainly a hot topic indeed. But." Um, What's the story with this creating GUI apps with Wix Python in your book? It feels like from the extent that I got to read it, which is not all of it, but a decent, you know, some of it, mm -hmm. it as a quick introduction of how to work with the widgets and stuff and get some stuff on the screen, understand the layout a, real, a little bit. And then it goes through and it just builds like a bunch of different apps, like a nice little image viewer, um, uh, a database viewer tool that uses SQL Alchemy to like explore stuff there, a calculator, an archiver, MP3 tag editor, those types of things. Mm -hmm. You want to maybe just tell us like kind of some of the key elements uh, before we actually before we get into those. Let's just maybe it, it's hard in code, but uh, on audio to talk about code, but maybe just give us like a sense of what is it like to get a, a, a window and a button on the screen or something like that. Um, sure. So, you know, um, Debix Python, uh, much like uh, PyQt, they, they're all class-based. So you're going to be inheriting from different classes to create all the widgets online. 
Whereas with Key Kenter, you don't have to do that. I see. So you might make like a window class and like a layout main section class or something like that. Kind of. Um, okay. Layouts usually aren't needed to be subclassed, but like um, you subclass a frame, which is the main window. You can subclass a panel, which is kind of what, kind of like the tabs on a notepad on, on your Firefox or mm. a Chromebook. You can you can create a notebook object that has multiple panels. When each of those panels is a tab, basically. I see. So it is like a multi-doc version or, or style that it'll support. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, and then within your frame, you have your panel. And then within the panel, you have your widgets. And so those are your children widgets. Like you have your buttons or your, you know, your scroll bar or your check boxes or whatever. Um, the code can get kind of unruly, but for just creating something really simple, you can do it in less than 100 lines of code most of the time. But you know, once you start doing like any, anything complex with with uh, WX Python, you're going to start adding a lot of code. Right, because if you can have say three buttons and a text field, and you well, want to you want to figure out how they lay out, there's like a couple of things that you're going to put just on the layout side, and then you're going to have to hook potentially the events. Right, you, like you can abstract that away a little bit, so it's not too bad. Like if all the okay. buttons do something similar, then you can make that really short. But yeah, if you if all the buttons do something completely different, then you could yeah, you know you have two different functions. Um, the lay you, the, I have written wrappers to make laying that stuff out simpler, so I don't have to repeat the same boilerplate. Yeah, all the of time. course. Yeah, students are like, why is this so complicated? Why do I keep doing this? And maybe that's the time to think about <laughs> how, how do I do it just one more time with a little more polish and then never mm -hmm. again. Yeah. Yeah. So the widgets have events, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, on a Windows, it'd be like a WM key down, like Win32 event that is then translated to the Wix event, which then calls back into, say, Python, right? And what you do is you give it, just uh, either a class level or just regular function. Say when whenever somebody clicks this button, just call this function, right? Yes, it's usually like like for buttons, it's like wx dot event button, and then you just bind it to a function, right? Um, or you could bind it to the entire app if you wanted to, so it captures the clicks. Yeah, what I thought was interesting looking through the framework was in many UI framework like native compiled built-in frameworks they don't basically the the button gets a click or it doesn't or somebody clicks the thing outside of it or it doesn't but in the javascript we have like bubbling events that go up and down so if i click on mm -hmm. a label but the label doesn't handle it you like uh, but but somewhere higher up maybe it's in a div and the div is handling the event like that would catch it right so you have this mm -hmm. ability to say go up until it's the right level to deal with this action. And it looks like WX Python has that as well. Yes, it does. Yeah, that that was a little surprising that you can sort of bind the same event at different levels and then either capture it or let it keep flowing up. So they both get hit, I guess. Yeah, you can do that. And you can you know execute your event and then you can say, I think it's event.skip yeah. and it'll go to the next level. Right, that's like don't don't let me consume the event. Let it keep going, mm -hmm. bubble it up or something. Yeah, yeah, really nice. So one thing that you talked about that I thought was interesting before we get into maybe a little more detail is you talked about uh, it's really nice to have a conception of what your app is going to look like, especially around layout. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you recommended well, one is just like writing stuff out on paper, which is always good. We also yeah. <laughs> recommended using um, Balsamic as something where you could potentially sketch out the UI. Yeah, I really like Balsamic because it just makes, it makes laying stuff out at kind of a breeze. Um, you could also, you know, you could use uh, that cute designer because it's free and open source. You could use that to lay, to draw a layout too. If you right, even though your destination is not ultimately cute. Correct. But it still lets you draw, drag the widgets around, right? Yeah, so you could still get a good idea of what you want it to look like using that. Yeah, I guess if you had a really old version of Visual Basic laying around. 
Yes, that also works. I, I thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> the VV6. I mean, that thing went out of support like in the 90s, but you might get it to run. But yeah, the balsamic one. I really like this. I've used this for prototyping uh, a couple of things. I think I used it a lot when I was building the TalkPython training platform and stuff like that. It's it's one of these wiry, wireframe type of tools that like specifically is not meant to look native or finished right mm -hmm. like it kind of looks as if you had drawn it by hand like the web browser it's it's sort of wiggly lines as if you would yeah you know, sketch that out right i i, I like a, this thing a lot it's a good recommendation yeah i really like it it's not super expensive and it does a good job of sketching the ideas that you have in your head yeah for sure uh, a couple of live stream comments, just to so get a quick shout out to you. Alexander says, interesting. Sounds like React in Python when we're talking about the event bubbling. Yeah, very cool. And then David has equated you to Brian Aachen. <laughs> Mike, Mike is to Python GUIs as Brian Aachen is to PyTest, indeed. Yeah, so really cool. Um, I guess one more general concept let's talk about a little bit before we maybe just touch on some of the lessons and whatnot from the various apps and the types of things that people could go play around with. And I'm mm -hmm. guessing the source code for these apps is just on GitHub available. Even if people don't have the book, they could probably go dig it up. Yes, it is. Yeah, same, same for all my stuff. And the extra thing that I really want to talk about is layout. So layout's interesting, right? You You've got these different, what are they called, resizers? Or sizers, not resizers, sizers. Yes, sizers in WX Python. Just sizers, yeah. yes. Yeah. So if you're going to put like two buttons next to each other, then you just want them to take up 80% of the space combined and have a little bit of margin or something. Mm -hmm. If you just put them in a location, well, that might be true for their size at first. But if you move the window, obviously, not so much. <laughs> right, yeah, they'll just so. <laughs> they'll stay there. They're not going to move. They're not going to change size. So, talk about the different layout sizers and how you can combine them. So, how do you build like real composed UI yeah, worlds? So, this? you know, you could use absolute positioning. I don't recommend it. But if you made your frame unresizable, then you could totally do that. Yeah. Um, but if you want to use sizers, I usually use box sizers. They support vertical or horizontal alignment. So if you set it you know, for vertical, which I think is the default, it will add the widgets from left to right across, or I mean horizontal. Sorry, I'm <laughs> getting myself all confused. All right, vertical is top to bottom, horizontal is left to right. So as you add them, the widgets will stack in that direction. And the nice thing is you can nest the sizers. So if I wanted to you know, add columns, I could put you know, three or four vertical sizers box sizes inside of a regular um, horizontal sizer or vice versa to just create these kind of stacks of widgets on my UI. All right. So let's think about this. So imagine I want to build like a photo viewer thing mm -hmm. and I want on the left, I want a vertical list of all of the image names, you know, just the short image names. Mm -hmm. Then uh, maybe folders and I click the folder and then in the right I get like a grid of photos. So overall, I've got the panel, mm -hmm. and then I would put a vertical sizer that has the the two two pieces, right? Yes, probably. The, the one on the left would be another vertical sizer that just takes a bunch of like little image name display and things. And on the right, maybe a horizontal one, or, or does it have to wrap? Would that wrap around? Or would it just shoot off the screen to the right eventually or make them really small or something like that? It should make them smaller if you if you make it too uh, too small. But you can also set uh, size hints in Debex Python that says, do not reduce this window beyond, you know, like 400 by 400 pixels or whatever okay. it is. Get like a scroll bar or something like that. Yeah, you could you can you can tell. So that's actually a different widget. There's a scrollable panel that you could add, and then in the, scroll bar will, the scroll bar will appear when you resize as appropriate. Right, OK. Um, another way you could do that is use a splitter window and then have your widgets, some widgets on the right and some on the left. Interesting. OK. So you, you really have to probably think about how do you compose these things, though. There's not like one 
super duper layout that's just going to do all the stuff. You're like, oh, oh no. here's here's a section. <laughs> there's a section, right? Yeah, I mean, that there is a flex grid sizer and a grid sizer. So if you know your layout's going to be kind of in a grid shape, you could use one of those grid sizers and lay them out that way. They're a little bit confusing to work with at first because you're trying to figure out, you know, where does everything go? Uh, they work great for like a calculator because that's a grid. Right, okay. But, and you know, they're probably not changing. It's, it's a fixed number of like nine or whatever yeah. things are going in there. And you could nest, you know, box sizes inside of the grids to make give yourself more flexibility. Mm -hmm. Make the return button bigger or something like that as it stretches. I, I believe you can make each cell in a grid sizer stretch differently, so you don't actually need to to do the nesting. I, I was thinking more like if you needed to like have stacks of widgets in a cell within the grid si sizer, mm -hmm. then you might need to put a different sizer inside of it. Yeah. Okay. Very neat. Uh, quick feedback from the live stream. Matt Robbins says, in my last company, we used a bunch of Wix Python. Your book was an awesome resource. Super cool. Oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah very good. All right. Now let's go on and talk about some of the apps in your book because I think, you know, thinking about like, what are the kinds of apps I could build with this framework reasonably and stuff that fits in a book usually has to fit that reasonable category. It's not like, <laughs> well, we're going to build Microsoft Word. And mm -hmm. off, like, you know, something that does a zillion things. So uh, let's see. The first one that you had there was really the first meaningful one was like an image viewer, which is a little mm -hmm. bit like like a simpler version of what I sort of just described, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I chose the image viewer because I didn't want to take a lot of code to create something that just shows you an image on screen. And because JPEX Python uses pillow underneath the it can support most image types natively, mm -hmm. which is really handy. Yeah, it supports, you know, the list is like seven or eight different formats, ping, JPEG, GIF, uh, mm -hmm. and on and on, right? Which is something that TK Enter doesn't do. It only supports like two or three natively. And then you have to give, give us a BMP and you're like, how do I get a BMP? Like in a tip, like where do <laughs> Yeah, it gets very unhappy if you do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's cool. And then it started out as just you've got a button that says choose a file and then you show it on mm -hmm. one of these these um, image widgets, which is pretty straightforward. But you know, I was still impressed that when you click the button, it's like a really clear way to open a dialog that is the native dialog. So in your case, you ha used your Mac file dialog and it has like mm -hmm. all the stuff you'd expect on the left. It's got like your favorites and your tags and you know, whatever customizations you've done to your Finder, whatever. Yeah, because so, like, Python does their native, the native ex widget. Exactly. And it, it just always drove me crazy that like, oh, I know on the real OS I can navigate to another folder <laughs> this way, but now I'm just hitting the up arrow over and over again. And, you know, it's just yeah. those little things, um, you know, they just, it, it's nice to have it native. Yes, I agree. I I feel your pain, so... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so to like, for example, open up file dialog, you create a context manager and you just say with, um, I don't remember the exact command, but you give it basically the the file description yeah. and then the file filter. And you say open and you just check to see if they hit okay versus cancel. And then you, you work with it in the, yeah, uh, all within of, the context. All, all of the WX Python uh, dialogs. And I think maybe even the frames support using them as a context manager to open and show them. Yeah, it would make sense if you wanted to create some the equivalent of a modal dialog, mm -hmm. but a custom one that you create, put that in a with block too, right? Would that work? Uh, if you inherit from Debex dialog, I believe it will, yes. Okay. Yeah, super neat. So I guess you probably have to learn your class hierarchy, it sounds. Like I got to know, I got I, this one derives from frame, that one derives from dialog. Unfortunately, so. <laughs> yeah, there is a bit of a learning curve, yes. But once you've got the the top level widgets figured out, which are frame, dialog, and window, and you almost never use window, you know, you're, it's not too bad. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. All right, another one that you built was the database viewer mm -hmm. uh, based on SQL Alchemy, object list view, and so on. And tell us about that. So I actually wrote this uh, example a long time ago for my blog, and then I updated it for my book. 
Um, I've always liked SQL Alchemy, and I realized that I could create a SQL Alchemy model class and use it with DBX Python because they have a, a third party widget called the object list view that basically ma matches a model in SQL Alchemy almost exactly. So I can kind of combine the two classes and make them work together in a way. So um, that's kind of what I did. I just made it so they could open up a SQLite database in the book. So you basically see the, ti the, the tables and then click on them and get the records or something like that? Yes, you can see the records. I think I made it so I can edit edit the records too. Or maybe that was just on my blog that I did that. Yeah. yeah. What widget do you use that shows basically the Excel looking view? That's object list view. Um, DebX Python has its own native widget called WRX uh, list control. And object list view is kind of a, a wrapper of that, that widget that makes it a lot easier to work with, in my opinion. Yeah. What about animations? I, mean, I know that doesn't have anything to do with the app that we're talking about, but is there some sort of support for like changing changing the screen or if I'm going to put something on the screen, um, like I want to build a dashboard that is maybe looking at all the analytics on our system and it updates once a second. Uh, how, how easy is that to do? So if you're talking like a graph, um, a graph or even if it just has numbers like here's the current flow rate of such and such or the number of users on the site versus like the yeah. minutes of video watched today up to date uh, by the second. You, you have like a couple. That. Yeah, you have a couple options. DBX widgets has a, I believe it's called a device context, wx.dc. It has a couple of different variants of that you can use to basically draw whatever you want. And it's the basis for creating a lot of the custom widgets that you'll see in the DBX Python demo. So you could use that to like draw any custom widgets you want. Um, I see. Also so you're just given like a, like a rectangle or whatever and just go crazy at, with the draw commands on it. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the alternative is that uh, DBX Python supports matplotlib and can embed it easily. And it also has its own PyPlot library, so it can draw them without matplotlib in time itself. Mm -hmm. So both of those are also options. Yeah, very nice. What's the the external like cust super custom control world look like? So we've got the Wix widgets, but are there like other third party libraries that you get? Like, oh, here's like a really fancy editable grid type of thing or auto completing um, drop downs or you know those is there an ecosystem around those types of things I and mean, i remember in visual basic and like windows forums there was like whole companies based around building <laughs> those little extensions well i know that i know the object list view was a third party one for a while and it still is third party but i think the the actual c++ version of it has outstripped uh, the current wrapper for it. So it's the current wrapper doesn't follow it very well anymore. Um, besides that, there used to be a, a, a guy, uh, and Andrea Gavana, I believe is his name. He created a ton of awesome custom widgets for DBX Python. And eventually, they got wrapped into the Python framework itself. So now it's like import wx.agw, and you have access to all of those custom widgets within DBX Python. Okay. But besides those, there's not a lot out there that I can think of that are like just custom ones you'd add on. Right. And I, I was doing some quick searching for whether or not there's um awesome list, basically, mm -hmm. for, for those type of things. I, I couldn't find, but maybe if people, if someone out there knows the one, they can send it to us, and I'll put it in the show notes. Cool. Yeah, cool. So another one that you built was one that would look at um, basically zip files or tarball and pull those apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what yeah. are some of the cool takeaways from that? Oh, for me, it was fun to to dig into uh, Python's native um, tar tar and libraries, which I haven't played with that much. And I was originally going to include the zip file, but uh, zip files tended to be more buggy when I was playing with it. So I just stuck with tarballs to keep it simple. But um, yeah. and the main takeaway is that it works really well with uh, WX Python. Um, I try to show newer concepts like pathlib in this book using 
yeah, in conjunction with Tarbo, uh, the tar file uh, library. Yeah, Pathlib is nice. Yeah. It's not entirely obvious when you first get to it that the division operator has been taken over. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> to, to combine <laughs> elements. But at the same time, it is uh, quite neat once you learn it. Yeah, the syntax always throws me when I see those examples. I'm like, what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, that's how it works. Yeah, well, same thing for date, time, and time deltas. Nice. Yes. And then you mix those with F strings and you get into a whole other world. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, All right. Uh, another one that you discussed was creating an application for NASA's API. I don't know what NASA's API is, but that sounds fun. Tell us about that. <laughs> so this one was actually recommended to me by the Kickstarter people uh, that backed my backed the book. They were like, so when I whenever I do a Kickstarter, I ask the backers, what ideas do you guys have? What do you think will be a good good addition? And someone was like, well, NASA's API is open, uh, uh, basically open source. You can query it if you have a license API key, and you can make it show you. Um, basically any pictures that NASA has publicly available. So the NASA API will let you, you know, get photos of the moon, get photos of their launches, get photos of Mars, you know, whatever. And nice. they really wanted an example of how do you make Debix Python hook up to a web API. So that's kind of what this, what, what this chapter is about. Yeah, that's a pretty cool example, right? There's a lot of fun stuff that you can check out there. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, yeah, it was fun. So at api.nasa.gov, you can go over there and yeah, there's a bunch of stuff. Pad maps for the moons, two line element data for Earth orbiting um, elements orbiting the Earth. I guess you know if you update it in real time mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah, nice. So what did you end up actually building? Like there's a bunch of APIs there. Um, I think this one only like loads. It has a basically a list control widget, which I, I, I use to display the search results when you query uh, the NASA search. And then when you click on them, it will load the image. So, you know, if I looked up like um, the Challenger space flight or Apollo or whatever, it'll show all the public NASA images in that list box and you can click on them and it will load the picture for you so you can view the picture. Um, yeah. There's a there's a ton of room for improvement, like how to download the picture, which I believe I covered how to download it with the GUI. But you could also, you know, add a add a, a tag editor so you could view the view the metadata in the images. Or, right. And then you could browse it by show me all the pictures of the shuttle or mm -hmm. you know, things from this mission or something like that. Or from this date. Yeah. yeah. Cool. That seems like a really fun thing to play with. And just people who are looking to you know, have a fun API out there in the world to choose. Uh, that seems like a neat one. Yeah, it was, it was really neat. Yeah. Super cool. So I guess, you know, there's a bunch of other stuff that we could talk about that you wrote about, but I think one maybe final thing, one of the challenges that's not immediately obvious with Python is how do I take my Python code and give it to somebody so they can put it in their doc or their taskbar as a picture and click it and see it without <laughs> them, without discussing, here's how you create a virtual environment, here's how you have the right version of Python, here's how you pip install the requirements. Like, how do you mm -hmm. distribute this as like what you know, normal people would perceive as an application? Well, fortunately, uh, the major uh, Python GUI builder, executable builders support Debrex Python. So in the book, I use PyInstaller as an example, because mm -hmm. it can package up WX Python pretty pretty easily. Okay. Um, it'll it'll basically you you have to give it a special command line, command line argument to tell it that it's a a windowed application versus a terminal application. Right. I think maybe the default is to also have a terminal window. It would distribute it, but yes. you have a, an odd terminal window just to the side of your app. Yeah, so if you had like any debug in your application, it'd show up in the terminal window, which you know might not be ideal. Yeah, no, for sure. So I cover that in the book. Um, the nice thing about Pi installers, it also works for creating executables on Mac um, for and, and Windows. Not all of them do that. Um, I have used Pi2xe pretty extensively over the years, and it it works great for Windows, 
but you know, again, it's not going to work for anything else. So, right. So you found Pi Installer was pretty reliable across the platforms. Yeah, it works really well. Um, the only problem I have is that I think if you do the all in one file, uh, Windows Defender will will mark it as um, malicious and delete it. Oh, that's not good. And I think it does that for you know whether it's a Win WebEx Python file or not. It anytime you create the one the one file executable with Pi Installer, it's like oh. That's a bad file. I'm going to delete it for you. Not ideal. Uh, no. I think someone can... must have used it to try to package up a virus or something at one point, and then it, it got fingerprinted, and that was that. Yeah, I think you can self-sign the file or something to get around that, but I, I didn't right. go into that in the book. Yeah, I think you got to register as a developer with Microsoft to get like a signing certificate or something. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever done that. So, but there are like when you say try to run it, you know, same thing on Mac. It could either sometimes it'll completely block it. Sometimes it'll say that came from the internet, but we kind of mm -hmm. recognize that person. Or I guess if you super duper sign it, it'll just run. Yes. Yeah. And um, depending on on the platform. So uh, another thing, uh, you know, one thing that I did is I created this little uh, little app that runs in the Mac menu bar, and I created that with Pi2 app, and then it just mm. gives people a .app file, well, zipped up, but the, then you unzip it as a .app file, yeah, and then you can just run it, and that's worked well. But like Pi2 exe, Pi2 app is a Mac only thing, right? yeah, like I, one platform. I know Pi2 app also works with WX Python. From my experience, so yeah, cool. So these are these sort of packaging utilities. They work pretty well for the different platforms. If you're using WebEx Python, sounds like yes. Yep, I haven't had any problems with them. You, you can get squirrely things with other packages, but not usually with WX. Yeah, very cool. All right, Mike. Well, I think that about is all the time we have to talk, talk about GUIs and stuff, at least uh, WebEx okay. Python. But I mean, give us give us your verdict. Is there something you enjoy working with, building apps that people are liking with it? Well, I, I don't know about other people, but I I still use it whenever I can uh, for work. I'll I'll create you know simple. Um, apps to demo whatever I need to demo to my employer or my my PM. So, I mean, you can still throw together a really simple app with JBX Python and only a hundred lines or you know a couple hundred lines and still show off something that looks awesome across platforms. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah, again, I know I keep going on and on, but the native bits just make me happy. <laughs> a hey, quick yeah. uh, couple of questions from the live stream. Uh, one is it doesn't want to show up. There you go. Uh, if I purchase the book, WebEx Python Recipes, is it still relevant or outdated? I'm not familiar with this book. You? Is, it, is this yours? Um, I have a WebEx Python cookbook from A Press. I believe the examples in it still work, but they're kind of like all over the place. I tried to group them intelligently, but I mean, they're helpful, but they're not going to. Like help you. I don't. I don't know how to describe it, but they're they're more like these are very specific things. So read the table of contents before you buy that one. If he's talking yeah. about Cody Precord's book, which is Dibex Python Recipes from Pact Publishing, I haven't read it in a while, so I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, and I I have no experience with it either. So, but you can check out this one. This has got at least uh, ten good little apps in it, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so I guess with that, we'll I'll ask you the final two questions that I always ask everyone. If you're going to write some Python code, what editor are you using these days? I'm still a big fan of Wing IDE from Wingware. Cool. So um, I hear a lot of people on the VS Code wagon these days. Like, why Wing? Uh, for me, I still like that it, it has um, a source. What do you call it? a source assistant, which basically shows you the doc strings and links to the documentation live at all times for whatever your whatever line of code you're on. So you know if you have imported something, it'll show you all that stuff and basically help you learn uh, new modules as you work. The other cool. thing I really like is the debugger. The debugger on it is really good. 
Yeah, fantastic. Okay, and then Notable PyPI package. I mean, there's always WX Python if you want to throw that one out there, but uh, if you got another one in mind. What you... um, for me, it'd probably be uh, Open Open PyXL because I've been working with it a lot in the last couple of months. Yeah. So Open PyXL basically lets you read and write Excel files, the newer format, right? The XLSX Correct. version. Yes, it does. And you can do formulas and formatting and everything. Is that right? Am I... Um, at formulas are kind of iffy, but the rest of it is it does do. Nice, very cool. So, so many people, I'm sure, receive Excel files all of the time, and they want to like process it with code rather than with you know a mouse and keyboard. So, yes. very nice. Awesome, awesome. All right, well, final call to action. People want to get started with WX Python. What do they do? Uh, they can check out my book, or you can just go to wxpython.org and get everything you need right there. Awesome. Yeah, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. So thanks, everyone, for listening. And Mike, thanks for all you're doing around the GUI stuff. Oh, thanks you so much for having me. You bet. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone, in the live stream. Catch you next time.